Hello lovely people. Today we are reading from the Royal Rainbow Textbook. Throughout history there have been men loving men, women loving women and people whose gender presentation did not match with the sex they were assigned at birth. But for common folk doing something about it wasn't exactly easy. For monarchs on the other hand, oh they can do mm, whatever they want. Kind of, maybe, sort of, uh, within reason. Yeah, mm, no. Mm. Not even being the king or queen of a country can actually free you from the trappings of a cishet society. I'm sure the bejeweled lace handkerchief was helpful in wiping away the tears, however. But make no mistakes, whilst it's a heavy head that wears the crown, it's also a head that can get away with a lot that society's norms say shouldn't be done. So keep watching to find out which countries made the list and subscribe for follow-up videos if you too are a history buff slash LGBTQ plus enthusiast, which now I'm saying out loud is a very weird thing to say. I mentioned in my Day in the Life with ADHD video that Norway is the only country I know of that allows royals to wed and yet remain in the line of succession, but many of you commented that this is also true for the Dutch royal family and for Belgium's royal family, as long as they ask permission from the elected government first. But fun fact, Belgian royals aren't actually allowed to marry the Dutch ones, which is a holdover from the War of Independence against the Netherlands though, and likely wouldn't actually be considered if it came up. We're all just assuming that, but it would be quite the plot twist for the Belgian government to pull on poor Princess Elizabeth. But in the past, there have indeed been several LGBTQ plus individuals who sat on thrones throughout Europe and other countries. But the world is a big place, so let's just start with one continent in this video. Now, of course, it's really important to realise that the terminology we use and our understanding of sexual orientation and gender identity have evolved over time. Historical figures may not have identified with modern LGBTQ plus labels or even classified what they were doing as part of their sexuality as a concept. Even today, we need reminding that behaviour and identity are not one-to-one. -one. In the most simplistic terms, yes, a bisexual who has only ever been with one gender is still a bisexual. Or yes, someone can do sexual acts but still identify with the term asexual. With that said, here are some of the notable examples of European monarchs who are known to have had same-sex relationships or expressed non-binary gender identities. King James I of England and the Sixth of Scotland. 1566 to 1625. King James I of England was also King James VI of Scotland and believed by many historians to have been attracted to men, he left quite the royal rainbow legacy. Born on June the 19th, 1566, James was the son of Mary, Queen of Scots, who you've probably heard of from such incredible works as What Did They Do to Margaret and Robbie? His father was Henry Stuart, Lord Darnley. He ascended to the Scottish throne as a toddler when his mother was forced to abdicate for having generally terrible taste in men, but also being a woman who didn't have much agency and was pretty much groomed and abused and actually justice for Mary. He ascended to the English throne in 16 after the death of Queen Elizabeth I and became the first monarch of both Scotland and England. Which is very interesting because for many centuries there had been a lot of war, many deaths, and all it needed was one baby. It's not just his fascinating royal lineage that is intriguing, but his connection to LGBTQ plus history. So during his reign, he was known for having close, intimate friendships with men, which has sparked much historical speculation about his sexual orientation, largely because we can't know for sure, but at the time of his reign, sexual orientation wasn't as openly discussed as it is today, yet he remained the talk of the town. One of the most famous relationships in James's life was with Robert Carr, who was a Scottish nobleman. Their homoerotic friendship was so close and physical that it led to rumours around court. For if they are this touchy-feely in public, what do they like in private? Carr's influence over James was quite significant, earning him the title of Earl of Somerset and later Duke of Somerset. We can't say for sure whether their relationship was romantic, it, it was definitely a close bond that shaped James's court. He also had a close connection with George Villiers, the first Duke of Buckingham. Buckingham was not only a confidant but also a favourite at James's court. Their relationship was so tight that James bestowed upon Buckingham the nickname Steeny, and my dyslexic brain can't work that out, and showered him with unearned titles and privileges, much like he did with Robert Carr. But at the same time, in James's treatise on government, which I can never get right, Basilican Doran, he wrote about the importance of a king marrying a queen and criticised unnatural lust between men. Interesting that you even mentioned that, James. Would that happen to be something on your mind? Of course, the context of the time influenced his views and the language used back then to discuss such matters was very different from what we use today. A lot of people nowadays have very prosaic home lives built on unnatural lust, so you know, don't knock it. 
Interestingly, James's reign marked a period of relative stability in England, which allowed for some tolerance towards LGBTQ plus individuals, compared to the turbulent times that followed. His open friendships with men challenged the rigid norms of the era, subtly paving the way for a more diverse expression of love and relationships in the centuries to come. But you know, despite his own excitingly queer personal life, we're not going to give him that, because what we remember King James for best is authorising the translation of the Bible into English, a version that bears his name, the King James Version, and this translation had a profound impact on the English-speaking world and the world that the English-speaking world then went on to colonise, so a large part of it including the LGBTQ plus community, as it provided a common text for English-speaking Christians to spread homophobia worldwide. One of our biggest exports, so thanks for that, James. He may have been enigmatic and may have had intriguing relationships with men, but he also messed things up for most of us, so. King Henry III of France, 1551 to 1589. In a country known for its flamboyant monarchs, if I say that King Henry III of France was truly fabulous, you have to know it means something. His life was glittering, scandalous and pretty queer. Born on September the 19th, 1551, Henry III was the third son of King Henry II and Catherine de Medici, and not expected to inherit the French throne. As such, he was a good candidate for the vacant throne of the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth. Uh, hmm, I know. Makes you think. Monarchy. Does it even mean anything if they can just swap thrones? But, age 22, he completely abandoned Poland-Lithuania upon inheriting the French throne when his brother, Charles IX, died without issue. He ascended to the throne in 1574, becoming the last of the Valois dynasty to rule France. Oh, spoiler. But what sets King Henry III apart from his royal predecessors is his unapologetically queer flair. Growing up, Henry was his mother's favourite. She called him precious eyes and lavished him with affection, which his siblings did not love, particularly his elder brother Charles, who grew to detest him. Fair says every not golden child in the room. Absolutely fair. It wasn't just his eyes that were precious though. Henry grew into a fashion icon and was a pioneer of androgynous style, rocking ruffled collars, silken tights and high heels long before they were mainstream. This trailblazing fashion icon made wardrobe choices that challenged traditional gender norms of the 16th century. But let's get to the juicy stuff, shall we? Henry III was essentially openly homosexual, at a time when LGBTQ plus acceptance was unheard of, obviously without the language of today. His closest companion was a dashing noblewoman named, named Jean-Louis. Can I do any French pronunciation? No. Jean-Louis de Nogaret. No? Carret. I'm guessing you don't say the T. Will I sign my children up for French classes? Yes. Yes, I will. Do I pay him? French sounds now under the age of two. Yes, and Chinese. Their relationship was so intimate that they were often seen sharing beds and referring to each other in the most affectionate terms. The king liked him so much that he raised him to the rank of a duchy and Nogare thus became the first Duke de Epignon. The new duke was so highly favoured that he had titles showered upon him, among them more French words. Maitre de Camp of the Champagne Regiment, Governor of La Ferre, Colonel General of the Infantry, First Gentleman of the King's Chamber, Chevalier de Ordre de la Saint Esprit, Governor de Bolin Prays, Loch, Lyon, Metz and its surrounding areas, Chevalier de Ordres de Roy, and Governor of Provence. At the death of the Duc de Joyeuse, he was awarded the titles of Admiral of France, Governor of Normandy, and Caen, and of Le Havre. The glittering court of Henry III was a safe haven for LGBTQ plus individuals. His group of favourites were known colloquially as les mignons, for the French mignon, the darlings, or the dainty ones, a term that was not meant to be complimentary, as these frivolous and fashionable young men were considered by the public to be ruining society with their effeminate weakness. I mean, you know, or just being fabulous at all times. But the king did not care. He appointed several quite not so quietly gay officials to key positions, effectively creating a mini paradise at the court. This acceptance extended to the arts, where queer playwrights and poets found inspiration and patronage. Despite the wild rumours and controversies surrounding his personal life, Henry III was no pushover. He navigated the treacherous waters of French politics with savvy strength. Even during a time of religious strife, his reign was marked by the infamous War of the Three Henrys, a tangled web of intrigue and conflict that makes modern soap operas look tame by comparison. I'm not going to say he was a great strategist, though. He essentially had the best male heirs and his family killed, and then 
he was all, oh my gosh, so shocked, when, wow, he was the only one left and his family lost the throne. I mean, eh? What was your plan here, Henry? The Duke of Guise mocks your penchant for wearing fabulous ensembles and is more traditionally manly than you. So you're going to off him, even though he's probably the best person to take over as king after you, and then what? I mean, admittedly, that does show a fierce commitment to fabulous style, but think these things through. Sadly, Henry III's life came to a tragic end when he was assassinated in 1589. But his legacy as a queer icon and a champion of effeminate style lives on, so he's got that. He showed the world that being true to yourself, even in the face of adversity, is the ultimate power move. So, yeah. King Louis XIII of France, 1601 to 1643. King Louis XIII of France was one of the country's most enigmatic monarchs. Shortly before his ninth birthday, Louis became King of France, when his father, Henry IV, was assassinated. Henry was stabbed by a Catholic fanatic on the way to his wife's coronation. Queen Marie de' Medici ruled as regent on behalf of her young son, but she wasn't a particularly good ruler and was involved in numerous intrigues with her Italian favourites rather than, you know, managing the country. The teenage king, meanwhile, was gallivanting about with other young men of the court. So, who was running things? He developed an intense attachment to Duke Charles de Albert, Duke of Floyens, who was two decades his senior. The king piled on titles and honours to his inseparable friend, the Duke, including commander of the Louvre Palace and Grand Falconer of France. Does he look after all the birds? Delbert was an enemy of the Queen Mother and used his influence over the king to facilitate her downfall. At 16, Louis exiled his mother and executed many of her followers. Discontented aristocrats rallied around Queen Marie because they were adults, and so was she, and they didn't love being pushed around by a teenager. And whilst Albert led a campaign to suppress the rebellion, he died of fever during the siege, so. Louis moved on from his first infatuation and had several other male favourites, like Henri Coffier de Rouge, Marquis of Saint Mars. Yes, I know I didn't pronounce that well, who was later found to be conspiring with a Spanish spy and beheaded. So, not an amazing match there. But wait, there is more. Louis XIII had a flair for fashion. He was known for his extravagant wardrobe, donning frills, lace, and sumptuous fabrics. He adored exquisite jewellery, and his love for sparkly things truly knew no bounds. Forget toxic masculinity, Louis was a trendsetter, all right, breaking all traditional gender norms with his rather fabulous style. He introduced wigs to the French court, a look that then went on to dominate men's fashion in Europe for nearly two centuries until the French Revolution. All of the best looks come from Paris. Louis was a big patron of the arts who loved theatre, ballet, and the performing arts, which back then was a pretty queer scene in itself. The French court under his rule was buzzing with creativity and expression, making it a haven for LGBTQ plus individuals. He also had a complicated relationship with his wife. King Louis had been married since the age of 14 to Anne of Austria, and it was no secret that the king did not enjoy sleeping with his wife and only performed his duty occasionally. After 23 years of marriage, the couple had suffered four stillbirths and had no living children. When suddenly, in 1638, Queen gave birth to a healthy baby boy, and two years later, a second son followed. This was considered a miracle, and thanks, the royal couple founded the Benedictine Abbey and dedicated France to the Virgin Mary. But there was a little speculation that the two boys may not have been fathered by Louis, or even birthed by the Queen. But that's a conspiracy theory for another day, so. While Louis' queerness isn't as explicitly documented as some other historical figures, his actions and the scandalous rumours that surrounded him leave us with a rather tantalising legacy. He wasn't just another king. He was an icon of queer expression and intrigue in the midst of French courtly drama. And what style! Queen Anne of Great Britain, 1665 to 1714. Am I pointing you to another video I already have on my channel? Oh my goodness, yes I am! But I have already covered how wonderfully queer Queen Anne was. Also reviewed the film The Favourite, so. In a past video that you can watch by clicking on the card in the top left of the screen, or the link in the description. Once this video is over, obviously, because you should uh, watch this video, thanks. That helped my analytics. Queen Anne was the first ruler of a united Great Britain and had a really close relationship with Sarah Churchill, Duchess of Marlborough, that was highly influential in Anne's political decisions. And yes, she is a relative of Winston Churchill and Princess Diana, fun fact. Tsar Ferdinand of Bulgaria, 1861 to 1948. 
Born on February 22, 1861, Ferdinand I of Bulgaria was a prince who would later become the Tsar of Bulgaria and was known for his hypersexuality. He was a man of many talents and interests, but what makes his story extra intriguing is the queerness that's said to have coloured his life. The previous ruling prince of Bulgaria, Alexander of Battenberg, had abdicated in 1886 after a pro-Russian coup, only seven years after he'd been elected. Yes, you can elect princes and kings, it's a thing. Ferdinand, a German prince of the House of Saxe Coburg and Gotha Kahari, was an officer in the Austro Hungarian army and was nominated for the role. He was the son of Prince August of Saxe Coburg and his wife Clementine of Orleans, daughter of King Louis Philippe I of the French. Despite being a cousin to basically every monarch in Europe, Ferdinand's accession was greeted with disbelief in many of the royal houses of Europe. Queen Victoria, his father's first cousin, stated to her prime minister, He is totally unfit. Delicate, eccentric, and effeminate, should be stopped at once. Ouch! Oh, nothing cuts deeper than a knife wielded by family. Whatever. Ah, uh, sure. Whatever though, Ferdinand actually did pretty well for the first 20 years. I mean, he was kind of iffy after that, but those first 20 years, he was good. He was noted to be what one might call Petty AF. On his journey to the funeral of his second cousin, King Edward VII of the United Kingdom, in 1910, a tussle broke out over where his private railway carriage would be positioned in relation to the heir presumptive to the Austro-Hungarian throne, Archduke Franz Ferdinand. The Archduke won out and his carriage was positioned directly behind the engine because his country was thought to be more important, even though he was just an heir. Rude. Not to worry though, the dining car was directly behind Ferdinand's carriage, so he just didn't let the Archduke through to eat. Ha! Huh. Didn't think about that one, did you? True queen behaviour. On a visit to German Emperor Wilhelm II, his second cousin once removed, in 1909, Ferdinand was leaning out of a window when the Emperor came up behind him and slapped him on the bottom. Ferdinand was understandably affronted by the gesture, but the Kaiser refused to apologise, so Ferdinand just exacted his revenge by taking the valuable arms contract he'd been about to give a German manufacturer and giving it to a French company instead. Topics I covered in 13 years of history lessons in a British school. Tudors, Nazis, Egyptians, the French and Germans hate each other. Yes, that was the name of the topic. Ferdinand was also known to holiday in Capri, the island in the Gulf of Naples that beginning in the early 19th century became popular with wealthy and aristocratic gay men and lesbians, acting as a safe place where they could be more liberal in their sexuality. A rumour went around that if diplomats from other countries wanted an audience with the Tsar of Bulgaria, they could find him there and bring along a handsome secretary or valet who would be left to entertain him once business was complete. My, how radically different rich and powerful people were in the past. Ferdinand married Princess Marie Louise of Bourbon Parma, daughter of Robert I, Duke of Parma, and Princess Maria Pia of Bourbon to Sicilies in April 1893. Historians describe this as a marriage of convenience intended purely to produce children. Marie Louise died on the 31st of January 1899 after giving birth to her youngest daughter, and after this point, Ferdinand's mother, Princess Clementine, the children's grandmother, took over their care. So he didn't even think about remarrying until then Princess Clementine died in 1907. And so, to satisfy dynastic obligations and provide his children with a mother figure, he married again, yet stipulated to his assistant that he wanted a bride who did not expect affection or attention. A++, what a catch. Princess Eleanor Ruse of Kostritz, a Prussian princess from what is present-day Poland, was chosen on the 28th of February 1908. Neither romantic love or physical attraction played any role, and Ferdinand treated her as no more than a member of the household. He showed scant regard for her. But she dutifully raised her stepchildren and devoted herself to the welfare of the Bulgarian people. Poor Eleanor. She came into her own during the Balkans and First World Wars when, working tirelessly as a nurse, she was a cause of great comfort for many injured and dying Bulgarian soldiers. It was said that she had a special gift for relieving suffering. Ferdinand, not so much. He jumped at the chance of joining World War I, even siding with the Central Powers, who he didn't particularly like because he wanted more territory, yet ended up losing all of the territory he'd uh, gained in the previous war. So, The English critic Sir Edmund Gross wrote of Ferdinand, In this war, where the ranks of the enemy present to us so many formidable, sinister and shocking figures, there is one, and perhaps but one, who is purely ridiculous. 
If we had the heart to relieve our strained feelings by laughter, it would be at the gross Coburg traitor, with his bodyguard of assassins and his hidden coat of mail, his shaking hands and his painted face. The world has never seen a meaner scoundrel, and we may almost bring ourselves to pity the Kaiser, whom circumstances have forced to accept, on equal terms, a potentiate so verminous. Oh. Wow, okay, there's queer coding our villains, and then there's, there's the straight microaggressions. Is it a microaggression? Are we? That's just, that's just out there. Ferdinand's sexuality wasn't exactly a quiet matter, you see. As somewhat of a hedonist, he was quite open about his bisexuality, despite the cultural mores of the time. His sexual relationships with men around him, be they valets or lieutenants, were apparently common knowledge. He also felt no need to hide his numerous affairs with women of humble position, and had a great number of illegitimate children, whom he claimed and supported. Financially, can people consent to relationships with a king? if they have nothing. Not really. Well, to save the Bulgarian monarchy after multiple military setbacks in 1918, Tsar Ferdinand abdicated at 57 in favour of his eldest son who became Tsar Boris III. In 1947, Ferdinand, then 86 years old, secretly married his 26-year-old assistant. Much to the displeasure of the members of his family, and I imagine her family, because an 86-year-old ex-kin of a monarchy that's been abolished is not a catch, and actively dangerous when you're living under the Soviet Union. Ludwig II of Bavaria, 1845 to 1886. Ludwig is also known as the Fairy Tale King, or the Swan King, and sometimes, really quite unfairly, the Mad King. But I'm not about that, and you'll find out why in a moment. He was born on August the 25th, 1845, to Maximilian II of Bavaria, who was then Crown Prince, and his wife, Princess Marie of Prussia. Against his parents' wishes, he was named after his grandfather, King Ludwig I, which actually worked out pretty well, since he had a much closer relationship with his grandfather than either of his parents, who were by all accounts distant and unloving. As an adult, he referred to his mother as my predecessor's consort. That is a step harsher than egg donor, or the adults I lived with. Unfortunately, both his grandfather and father had died by the time that Ludwig was 18, leaving him to face ruling alone, and he felt himself ill-prepared to handle the responsibilities of being a monarch. Looking back a decade later, he said he became king much too early. I had not learned enough. I had made such a good beginning with the learning of state laws, and suddenly I was snatched away from my books and set on the throne. Well. I am still trying to learn. Aren't we all? One of Ludwig's first acts as king, however, was to summon his idol, the composer Richard Wagner, to court. The 51-year-old Wagner was given an unprecedented, almost two-hour audience with the king. Wagner wrote after meeting the young king, Today I was brought to him. He is unfortunately so beautiful and wise, soulful and lordy, that I fear his life must fade away like a divine dream in this base world. You cannot imagine the magic of his regard. If he remains alive, it will be a great miracle. Normal. A completely normal thing to write about a teenager you've just met. Gosh, he's so beautiful, definitely going to die because of it. Ludwig, um, immediately developed quite the crush. Love has strength for all. You are the star that shines upon my life, and the sight of you ever wonderfully strengthens me. Ardently I long for you, O oh, my presiding saint, to whom I pray. I should be immensely pleased to see my friend here in about a week. Oh, we have plenty to say, if only I could quite banish from me the curse of which you speak, and send it back to the deeps of the night from whence it sprang. How I love, how I love you, my one, my highest good. My enthusiasm and love for you are boundless. Once more I swear, you faith till death, ever, ever, your devoted Ludwig. <gasps> Teenage crushes do be like that. Oh, hon, we've all been there. But maybe aim for someone who isn't 51. Ludwig's attraction to handsome boys and men had always been a part of his teenage life, despite his very religious upbringing, making it difficult for him to accept his sexual orientation. A few years prior, he'd been best friends slash lovers with the handsome aristocrat Paul von Thurn and Taxus. I probably messed up that name too. They went on long horse rides together, read poetry, enacted scenes from the operas of Wagner, yes, that Wagner, and potentially did other things behind closed doors because, you know, you're allowed to have sleepover parties with your same-sex friends. 
It's a very confusing grey area for your parents to police if your sexuality isn't entirely straight. Or you are straight, but your gender isn't what they thought it was. Ludwig didn't even have involved parents, so... No. A letter from Paul to Ludwig read, Dear and beloved Ludwig, I am just finishing my diary with the thought of the beautiful hours which we spent together that evening a week ago, which made me the happiest man on earth. Oh Ludwig, Ludwig, I am devoted to you. I couldn't stand the people around me. I sat still and in my thoughts I was still with you. How my heart beats when, as I passed the residence, I saw a light in your window. Unfortunately, Paul was not going to be king and couldn't do exactly as he pleased, so had to follow his family's wishes and find a suitable bride. It wasn't just Paul's wealthy and powerful family, though, who wanted an heir, and soon the same pressure was on Ludwig. Despite every ambitious family in the land attempting to force their daughters into the path of the handsome young king, he just wasn't particularly keen until his cousin and dear friend, Empress Elizabeth of Austria, known as Cici, convinced him to go for her youngest sister, Princess Sophie, who was also keen on Wagner. Are you sensing a theme? On New Year's Day in 1867, to the delight of all Bavaria, young Ken Glaugvig announced his engagement to the Princess Sophie. Yay! The wedding was to take place in August, but by early summer, it had been postponed to October. And then, just two weeks before the wedding, Sophie received a letter cancelling the engagement. So, Ludwig wrote in his diary, Sophie written off. The gloomy thoughts are gone. I long and thirst for freedom. Uh, which is delightful for him. That summer, King Ludwig formed a deep attachment to Richard Hornig, a groom employed at one of his royal stables. Hornig was only five years older than the king, so a bit more appropriate, and shared his passion for riding. Very quickly and not surprisingly, Hornig was promoted to the office of Crown Equerry and Master of the Horse, which made him a more respectable companion for the king. This is a passage from Ludwig's diary. November 21st, 1867. I have not received any letters from R, and I feel so sad. My heart is but popping out from my chest, and twice I have cried. Foolish me for doing so, for I know that he is unable. I hold his letters to my face and kiss the signature he's given me and hold the letters to my skin, closing my eyes and believing he is with me. I wish to have no other men, though I am tempted. And God, have I met beautiful boys in Berlin, but they have not his eyes and their voices do not resemble his. I can see him naked in bed, naked and perhaps tearful, his long yellow hair over his smooth back, and I bite my lips, for I hate that he is so far away from me, so far. Um, you know the whole, we can't know for sure that they had homosexual tendencies because it was the past, disclaimer. I think we know. Hunning was not Ludwig's only lover. There were also two actors who Ludwig showered with expensive gifts, vacations and stays in his castle. Alphonse Weber and the Hungarian Joseph Keynes. I realise I'm butchering their names, but I'm doing my best with the written phonetics the internet gives me, so... Just, you know, remember I'm deaf and give me some grace, okay? I'm sorry. Back to Wagner and Ludwig's huge unrequited crush. So, Wagner was a known womanizer. Ludwig generously paid off all of Wagner's debts and even built a theatre and a villa for him. Without Ludwig's patronage, Wagner might have never been able to get out of debt or complete many of his greatest works. So yes, some of the world's best opera, brought to you by homosexuality. There are letters between the two that hint at Wagner being aware of Ludwig's attraction to him, and the King's letters make it pretty clear. Wagner had to continuously play with Ludwig's affection in order to keep the money rolling in, but he never actually took it anywhere or promised anything. When Ludwig was not throwing money at Wagner or falling in love with stable boys, he was commissioning the construction of extraordinary works of architecture, two incredible palaces and a spectacular castle, which is the inspiration for Disney's Cinderella castle. Yes, it's that castle you see on your Instagram feed all the time. <gasps> Oh, what? Just me? In 1880, Prussia launched a campaign to unify and control the different kingdoms of Germany. The Prussian king, Wilhelm I, won the power struggle, and Ludwig was left as a pretty useless figurehead in his country, with zero power and not much to do other than pass the time however he wanted. I can't lie, that does sound like the ideal monarch role to a lot of people. Not to Ludwig. Instead, he became increasingly withdrawn from politics and public life and lent into his eccentricities, spending most of his time hidden away at the royal residences in the country. 
Servants were instructed to hide when they heard him coming, or else stand silent and motionless as a statue, so as not to disturb his thoughts. He was not doing okay. Although, we know this from his ministerial cabinet, who were all about to be dismissed by Ludwig since he no longer trusted them, when they found out his plan and had him declared insane without even a medical examination, so pfft, they instantly deposed him. And none of the four psychiatrists who even signed the report even met the king, so yeah. And yet the report contained such bizarre stories as the king ordering his highly attractive young goomsman to strip naked and dance for him, which, okay, so maybe they heard some stuff. Homosexuality was not technically illegal in Bavaria at the time, but being king meant continuing the royal line and producing an heir was considered his duty, a duty in which Ludwig clearly had no interest. And so on June the 12th, 1886, Ludwig was deposed. He was escorted out of his beloved castle and taken to Schlossberg at Lake Starnberg. The next day, Ludwig's lifeless body was found floating in knee-high water along the shore of the lake. The autopsy found no water in Ludwig's lungs, and yet his death was still declared a drowning. Found dead alongside Ludwig was Dr. Gooden, one of the corrupt psychiatrists who had, de who had declared him insane without an examination. His body showed signs of a struggle and attempted strangulation. The Empress Cece said of her beloved cousin, the king was not mad, he was just an eccentric living in a world of dreams. They might have treated him more gently, and thus perhaps spared him so terrible an end. Queen Christina of Sweden, 1626 to 1689. The Swedish queen who was known for her refusal to marry, insistence on dressing in men's clothing, and having many very close relationships with women. And was played by Greta Garbo in the film of her life. Yes, indeed, that one. Now you may be wondering why her name is not higher up on the list. Why have I not talked about her already? Well, my dearest, that is because there is a very special video on Queen Christina coming up in just two weeks' time. She got her own video. Go her! If there's anyone else that you feel is missing from this list, please do mention them in the comments down below. I absolutely love learning about new historical figures, especially LGBTQ plus and disabled ones. Insert caveat about how it's important that we approach historical accounts of these figures with sensitivity and an awareness of the historical context in which they live. But also, is that fun? Can't we just enjoy ourselves imagining everyone in the past having jolly romps? I know this video only covered a few European monarchs, but I definitely could not fit everyone into one video, so there will be a follow-up video with other royals from around the world coming soon. So subscribe and hit the notification bell to make sure that you don't miss it. If you've previously seen my historical profile series where I look at just one person per video, then let me know what you think of this listicle style video going through a greater number of people. I have to say, it's, uh, it's pretty heavy on the male side, but then we do have a lot more kings than queens, so. Perhaps next time I just go for royals and then it's free for all. We've got the princesses thrown in there too. Thank you to those of you who've watched all the way through to the end of this video. Go you, even if you are just letting me play in the background because you like my voice. That's actually still really helpful for my channel and I appreciate it. Especially if uh, you're playing those mid-roll ads without an ad block. Gold star for the three of you. Well done. This month, well, this month has been very hard, <laughs> and I'm looking forward to things getting better. But for now, thank you so much for your support, and I will see you in my next video. Thank you. Bye-bye.